The most toxic relationships tend to be centered around one thing, the inability to have healthy arguments. When a disagreement turns into an all-out verbal war where one side's trying to win over the other, it inevitably leaves both sides feeling more hurt and divided than ever before. But here's the troubling part. Too many people are stuck in these toxic relationships either because one, they can't spot when they're being dragged into a fight, or two, they're actually the aggressor but don't even realize it. So in this week's edition of the Soft Skills Spotlight, I'll help you spot three key differences between an ugly fight and a healthy argument in order to help you determine whether to move on from that debate or that person altogether. We'll do this by juxtaposing two things, Andrew Tate's first interview after being under house arrest and Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand's debates on gender differences. Let's see if you can spot the first problem during Andrew Tate's interview with the BBC. You're facing some very serious allegations. Correct. Rape human trafficking, yep. and also because there's a great deal of concern about the things you say. It's concern about the influence you have being a harmful influence, but let's start with the allegation. One of the subtle clues that you're arguing with an aggressor trying to prove you wrong is when they slide in subjective digs at your character or your behavior, and then move on quickly to the next point before you even have a chance to interject. This is what I call the sneak in. Whether you're being grilled on camera in front of millions like Andrew or at home with your partner, the sneak in is a primary tell that their main objective is to prove that they're right and you're wrong. But when the reporter, Lucy, says that his actions were harmful and then tries to change the subject, Andrew immediately does this. Not necessarily a harmful influence, the fact that I'm massively influential over the youth, and I understand that, but it's my influence as a whole which people are afraid of, not necessarily the things I say. The moment he hears Lucy try the sneak in, he jumps in. And while it's helpful to take control over the narrative, interrupting someone else sets the tone for a hostile environment where your counterpart will be less inclined to listen to your point and your conversation will just devolve to you guys talking right past each other. If you hear a sneak in, you should take mental note of it along with the question. When they pause, you then should first respond to the sneak in before answering their question. Now contrast Lucy's comments to Andrew with Russell Brand's comments to Jordan Peterson about Jordan's views on transgenderism. It seems that, and indeed having watched other interviews and the objections that other interviewers have presented to you, like it seems that a transgender person is in a position of vulnerability. But you're saying this is not about transgender, this is about language and it's about oppression. That's what you're saying. The key is that people willing to engage in healthy debate will always articulate their points of view on the world as subjective. Specifically, the phrase, it seems to me, is an example of taking ownership over your own perspective and acknowledging that it could be incorrect or even misguided. It's a great non-confrontational way of expressing your point of view without offending the other person. The other person can't get mad that you perceive something a certain way, but they can get mad if you say something that's very charged, like you're wrong. However, someone saying it seems to me is not sufficient if they pair that with something like this. You have said my job was to meet a girl, go on a few dates, sleep with her, get her to fall in love with me to the point where she'd do anything I say and then get her on webcam so we, we could become rich together. This is a classic example of misquoting someone else. And when this happens, you may feel an impulse to say something like this. I don't think that's what I personally said. That's, that's exactly what no, you said that's, on that's, 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 No, I've never said that. That's something that you found on the internet. Doesn't mean I've said it. And, and, and again, if any female on the planet has a problem with me, I strongly recommend her to go to the police and try and pursue me for criminal charges. It's actually very interesting. It's very easy to cut someone off, vehemently deny the allegations, or say that something was taken out of context. But by doing this, Andrew has now escalated the confrontation with this reporter because she now feels inclined to cut him off. In this case, I would have recommended that Andrew seek specifics. A lot of arguments are based on false premises, spoken with great confidence but with minimal research. By playing out exactly how they came to their conclusion in a step-by-step -step fashion, you're revealing the shallowness of their claims, particularly if you come to realize that it was all taken out of context. But the key is that you need them to come to that conclusion, not for you to force it on them because then that's when they become defensive. On the other hand, people seeking a healthy debate will actually do something more like this. I was myself struck with, like, you know, I think the tweet that you you were banned for was sort of like commenting on Elliot Page. 
How do we prioritise compassion, kindness, love? And can't this basic palette of principles prevent us from getting into conflict around these ideas? Russell does two things here. The first is he makes a very specific reference to an indisputable fact. Jordan did get banned from Twitter for tweeting about Elliot Page after Elliot came out as transgender. The second thing he does is he shares this fact as context behind a genuine question instead of as an attack on the other person. Now with Russell and Jordan, there's already a level of mutual respect, but when you anticipate that something could get contentious, there's one thing I'd recommend that Andrew does beautifully to keep the conversation from completely falling off the rails. It's very difficult for me to sit here and have a very frank and honest conversation with you while we're in the territory of Romania about a legal case that's going on within Romania. But I can't incriminate myself in any way and I have to be very careful with what I talk about. There are no charges yet. Correct, there a are no charges. Has... And I've agreed to speak to you, but I have to be as honest and frank as I can while also protecting myself and following my legal counsel. Andrew sets the boundaries up front. This is a great tactic to show that you're not being defensive, but rather that you're adhering to a specific standard instead of moving a goalpost to fit a specific agenda. And here's precisely why that comes in handy. One of the witnesses says, we can't just, we, we can't go into the case. The case is open and active. When you're sparring with someone whose sole objective is to win, you need to set boundaries so that they don't say any overgeneralized statements or try to bring in irrelevant personal facts to incriminate you. It's also helpful to set boundaries on how you'll argue, like promising each other that you will both not interrupt each other under any circumstances. And when you both play in between the lines, watch what can happen. I feel that Elliot Page should be able to do whatever Elliot Page wants to do. For me, the basic principle of kindness and compassion is going to be my guide when dealing with Elliot Page. I do have recourse to the idea of what do I want Elliot Page to feel? Happy, accepted. That's what I want Elliot Page to feel. You know, and if there are aspects of that I don't understand, then I'm willing to take the hit. The key is that people engage in a healthy debate always stay on topic. In this case, their debate is centered around solely why Russell supports Elliot's tweet and why Jordan does not. And furthermore, he's only speaking in first person. There's nothing Jordan can say to dispute Russell's point because it's entirely personal. And when you listen, you'll be much more receptive to your points than if you were to hear something very inflammatory. The reason why Lucy and Andrew's argument devolved into a verbal war and why Russell and Jordan's led to greater mutual respect can be traced down to a simple framework coined by world champion debater Boso called the RISA framework. Is the argument real? Is the argument important? Is the argument specific? Are we aligned in our objectives of wanting to participate in the debate? And if you feel like all the RISA boxes are checked, then something beautiful can come from it. I think you're beautiful and full of love. I really believe in that. And then when I sort of hear people being dismissive of you, it upsets me and I see how you arm them. Sort of in their language, dead naming Elliot Page. And I feel like that's why would you do that? Now this is a great example of appealing to an alternative identity to help them see your perspective. But more importantly, when you speak from a place of compassion, that you voicing anything confrontational is mainly intended to help improve the dynamic between the two of you, that's when you'll notice the other side start to nod their head like Jordan does here. And honestly, that's true love. But many times it's really hard to show just how much you love someone with your words. You're worried that you might sound too contrived, too generic, or too long-winded. But this world-class comedian did a brilliant job of delivering a heartwarming message better than almost anyone I've ever analyzed. Check it out.